world-class scientific research requires advanced computing support at every stage. That's why Jefferson Lab is blazing new trails in data science. The lab's Data Forward agenda includes a detailed plan for managing data, from source to archive. Whether it's generated in supercomputing simulations of advanced theory, generated in support of real-time processing for experimental operations, or generated in nuclear physics experiments at Jefferson Lab. For instance, this means storing as much as one gigabyte of new lab experimental data every second, adding up to 100,000 gigabytes every day. Once stored and carefully archived, the data can be accessed, compared, and analyzed by researchers around the world now and into the future. Hello, I'm Kishan Rajput, and I welcome you all to the second episode of Bite Size Science with Jefferson Lab Season 2. Today, I will talk to you about the art of machine learning, how machines learn, where do we use machine learning, and what are its different types. So what is machine learning? Well, before talking about machine learning, let's take a step back and think about how we as human learn. We have the ability to learn and we get better at doing certain tasks with more and more experiences. Most of the time, we have a teacher to teach us or to give us feedback, and we learn based on the feedback. For example, in school, we are shown these pictures of different animals with their names and their characteristics, and that's how we learn about them. Similar to this, machines can be made to learn as well. Machines or computers in general can also learn based on experiences. But the difference here is machines are not living beings, so they cannot live the experience. We need to provide those experiences to them in the form of data. We feed in data to a computer program and the program learns to produce certain output for a given input. But important thing to note here is that machine learning models can only do a specific task that they are trained for and does not necessarily generalize experiences from one task to another as we do as human. At least not yet, but we are getting there. We're improving machine learning day by day. In fact, most of us use machine learning in our daily life. We might just not notice it. So let's look at some of the examples. One of the obvious one is route navigation. We use these navigation apps to get to places that we might not know the route to. Or you might just want to go from office to home, but you want to know how much time it would take based on current traffic. These applications use machine learning to find the best route that would take least amount of time from your location to your destination, or it might be least distance. One other example is your virtual assistants, such as Siri or Alexa or Google. These all applications use machine learning to understand your verbal commands and to decide what action to take in response to that. If you watch movies or series on Netflix like me, you must have seen it recommending new movies or series based on what you have watched so far. This is also an application of machine learning. There are many other widely used applications of machine learning, such as email spam filtering or Google search, and the list just keep on going. Um, I'll let you figure out more details about these online. Now, you may have heard the term machine learning or artificial intelligence a lot recently, but it was all started back in 1950 when Alan Turing defined something called Turing test. It is still valid, and basically it is a test to determine whether a machine can demonstrate human intelligence. According to Alan Turing, if a machine can interact with a human being without being detected as a machine, then it has demonstrated human intelligence. In 1952, IBM, which is a well-known research organization, developed first learning algorithm to play the game of checkers. In 1957, the first neural network uh, was proposed which simulated thought process of human beings. Neural network is most widely used machine learning algorithm nowadays. But machine learning have gained more popularity only within the last couple of decades or so. As demonstrated in this figure, uh, if you look at this, uh, the growth, it's almost getting doubled every two years, which is exponential growth in the machine learning papers. Now you might be wondering why we took so long 
So the reason is machine learning need large amount of data and that data need to be structured or well organized. It also need a lot of computing for training a machine learning model to do a specific task. So to put things in context, let's look at memory unit in computers. One letter in your, in your phone or computer takes about one byte of memory. A book without any formatting or pictures, but just the plain text would be around 1 million bytes, which is called one megabyte. And 1 billion bytes or one gigabyte would be more than a thousand books. As of now, if we add everything from photos uploaded to social media website to Curiosity Rover exploring Mars, all the data together, we are producing about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day, which is about 4,000 books, almost 8,000 times the entire content of Congress. We are producing that much data every day. On the other hand, we have also improved our computation power in computers exponentially over the years. Currently, the most powerful computer owned by Meta can perform a billion times billion calculations per second. So as a simple example, if you look at iPhones, iPhone 4 was released in 2010, iPhone 13 was released last year in 2021. Between these two devices, the increase in computational power is almost 1000 times. That's a huge increment. As in another example, if one computational job that takes about one second today would have taken almost about two months in 1994. So now you can think why machine learning is getting popularity. We have the data, a lot of it, that we can use to train the models. And we also have computational power to do that. Now let's talk about different types of machine learning. There are three major types of machine learning supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In this episode, I would, I would talk about supervised learning and unsupervised learning in detail. And I feel like reinforcement learning can be a separate episode in itself because it's a slightly advanced machine learning technique. Going into a little bit detail about supervised learning, supervised learning need data along with the target labels, what we want to get out of the model. So one of the supervised learning tasks is classification, uh, classifying different data into different categories. For a very simple example, if we have pictures of bananas and picture of apples along with their labels, so we say these are apples, these are bananas, and we feed these into a machine learning model and train it to identify them. So these data during training would pass through the model again and again, and the model will learn how an apple looks like or how a banana looks like. Um, of course, machine learning model cannot look at the picture, but it processes each and every pixel of these pictures and it know it learns the pattern. It know if, if a pixel or looks like a red color or if it has certain pattern, it's an apple. Um, if it has a yellow color and has certain shape, it's a banana. So after training the model, if we give it a new picture of an apple, it'll say it's an apple. If we give another picture of banana, it'll say it's a banana. There are a number of other uh, classification applications. Identifying objects and images is one of those, as I mentioned. One other could be answering yes or no questions in video surveillance. A lot of um, security agencies use it to figure out if there's any violence in, in the video. Uh, it can also help with medical diagnosis. Uh, it can also do um, social media picture tagging because it'll do, it'll identify the face and it'll um, classify it to one of the registered user in order to tag them. Another supervised learning application is regression. Um, unlike classification, in regression, we do not have a fixed set of output. Um, it, it's a continuous value that's coming out of the model. So we feed in some data X and it'll transform that into some other data Y. So the role of machine learning model here is to mimic how nature would transform data X into Y or how some other system would transform it. For a very simple example, uh, if we have one input variable and one output variable, um, and since it's, this is supervised learning, we know the labels. So if you look at these scatter dots, those are our data. 
uh, we have an X and corresponding Y. A machine learning model would draw a line that will closely match with the, these data points. And that's the function that it has come up with to transform X into Y. So if you feed in a new value of X anywhere between these range, it will be able to map that to corresponding Y. So it'll transform X into Y. Of course, this is a very simple application or simple example. A real life application of regression could be housing price prediction or stock market prediction, sales forecasting or credit score forecasting. So if you talk about housing price prediction, it, it, the model need to take a lot of different inputs. There could, cannot be just single factor deciding a price of a house because it'll take the size of the house, the number of bedrooms it might have, number of bathrooms, uh, whether it has a backyard or pool and stuff like that. So there are a lot of input that will go to the model and the model will learn to transform all those information into one single number, which would be the price for that house based on the market in the, in the neighboring area. Now let's talk about unsupervised learning task. Uh, it does not require labeled data unlike supervised learning. Um, one of the unsupervised learning tasks is clustering. It is very similar to classification, but we do not have a predefined classes such as apples or bananas. In a very simple word, clustering is putting similar things together. If you are given a bucket of flowers, different kind of mixed flowers in a bucket together, and you separate them based on their type, you are doing clustering. Now, type is just one property. You could also cluster them based on their color or whether you like or dislike them or any other property. There are algorithms in machine learning that can do exactly the same. They are able to identify the patterns in the data and based on similar or not similar patterns, they can put the data in, in, into different categories or different groups. One other unsupervised learning task is dimension reduction. It is reducing the number of features in the data. For example, if you have a student data set, which has three features as age, their life stage, whether they are a kid or a teenager or an adult or a senior, and their height, you could just remove the life stage variable from this data since that information can be inferred from the age data. Of course, this is a very simple example um, and in, in large complex data set, we do not have this kind of scenario. So we take help of machine learning. Machine learning can combine two or more uh, features into one feature while still carrying the same amount of information. They can recover back those features that were merged without significant loss of information. So if you look at the bottom picture here, we have this three-dimensional data cube we can use machine learning to transform it to a two dimensional data set, reducing one dimension. So we might just merge two, two different features into one. And then we can also uh, reduce it to one dimensional data. But there's a trade off here between the reduction and the information loss. More you reduce the dimension, more information you would lose. So now we have talked about what is machine learning, where we use it, and uh, what are different types, you might be wondering what a typical machine learning pipeline looks like. What do we exactly do to achieve these things? Of course, the first step uh, in the machine learning pipeline is collecting data because we need data to train a model. Once we have the data, we pre-process the data and remove any bad entries or corrupt data entries. Once we have a processed data set, we divide the data into training and testing set. Um, we do this to make sure that the model trained on training data can also do well on the test data, which is which it is not trained on. So it can generalize to unseen data. So once we have the training and testing data set, we train the model with the training data set. And once we have the trained model, we validate it on the test data to make sure that it can generalize to the, to the unseen data. And once we're happy with the, with the model performance on the test data, we deploy it and we put it to the use. But depending on the application, we might need to collect more data and retrain the model because things keep changing. Um, nature is growing, data keep changing. So we want to make sure 
um, our model, our machine learning model is able to cope up with the changes. So now let's talk about where do we use machine learning at Jefferson Lab. Um, so in nuclear physics experiments at Jefferson Lab, we collide electrons with other tiny particles to make even tinier particles. As you might know, we have the accelerator, which we use to accelerate electrons to a speed very close to speed of light. And then we collide these electrons to a target, something like a proton. This collision breaks down the proton and create even smaller particles. And we study the properties of those particles that makes proton. What I'm showing here is a diagram of a detector for a new experiment that we are building in Hall A at Jefferson Lab. After collision, as you can see here in this figure, these tinier particles would travel through these detectors and we would have sensors to record their properties, such as their speed, um, their energy, or um, at the angle at which they hit these uh, sensors um, and other properties as well. Once we have these data, we record them and analyze those data to study the particles. But one of the first steps in analyzing that data is to separate the data based on what particle they belong to. We call it particle identification. We can utilize the superhuman capabilities of machine learning to do it for us. So what are we looking at? We have the data from the readback in the detectors and our target is to classify the data samples based on which particle they belong to. In a running experiment, we would deploy this trained machine learning model and it would classify the data in, in real time when we are collecting it. But since this experiment is still in development, our goal here is to find out what level of resolution do we need in this reading sensor, data collecting sensor, to do a, a desired job at separating these, these particle data. So here are uh, different sensor reading for uh, two different particles, pions and kaons. First, in the, in the first column here, we have uh, some readings from pixel readout. And the second column shows some reading from quad readout and PMT readout. These are basically different sensors. And as you can see, the resolution of the, the data decreases from pixel to PMT. Now we have the data, we have their labels, so we can use supervised learning. And since we have a fixed number of classes, pion and kaon for this example, we can use supervised learning classification in particular. So we feed in all these data to a machine learning model and the, modern, the model will learn uh, how these different pattern looks like for different particles. So once this model is trained, we would feed in a new reading from the sensor and we ask the model what particle these data belong to. Now for this specific case, since this is the data for a pion, the model will say this pattern closely matches with pion. So I'm going to classify it as pion. So with this simple classification model, we are able to achieve more than 99% accuracy in separating these particles. Um, another such application is detecting faults in accelerator. As you might already know, accelerators are very complex machines with thousands of pieces of equipment working together. Running an accelerator is expensive and sometimes accelerators trip or faults occur. And that would cause us to stop the experiment and that is undesirable. Machine learning can help predict a fault even before it occurs. This should help us mitigate the faults or lower the chances of a fault by changing the configuration or settings of the accelerator. Here, I'm showing four different samples of the data taken from SNS Accelerator at Oak Ridge National Lab. This is a current, current data of a beam passing through a sensor during acceleration phase. Two of these data samples are from just before a fault and other two are taken during normal operation. It is really difficult to say which one is before a fault or which one is leading to a fault and which are normal. Now, for this data set in particular, we have the labels since these data are taken from real events. The middle two data samples are taken just before faults and we can't detect the fault just by looking at these, these uh, data samples, but machine learning can do that. 
Another important thing to note here is that there's a very short time window between each of these data pulses. It's about 16.6 .6 milliseconds. So our machine learning algorithm need to be quick in deciding whether a data sample is leading to a fault or not. Preferably, it, will, it should take less than 10 milliseconds. So we still have about 6.6 .6 milliseconds to take preventive actions. Also, we need to have very low false alarm rate um, while keeping the true fault detection rate high. Because if we have false alarms, we would keep changing the accelerator settings or um, lowering the intensity of the beam that would degrade the, the beam quality and ultimately the experiment data. So for this application to train a machine learning model or to predict faults before they happen, we pair different data samples leading to fault with normal data, as well as normal data with normal data and train a similarity-based model. Basically here, the model takes in a pair of input and produces an output between zero and one, where zero being two inputs are similar and one being they are not similar. So with this model, we are able to detect about 60% of the faults before they occur while keeping false alarm rate below 0.5%. So now you might be wondering, uh, this looks very similar to supervised classification. Why did we use similarity-based uh, model? Why not just use something like apples a banana example where we feed one single input to the model and model would say whether it's leading to a fault or not? Well, the reason is, Fault detection is a special case of classification where we might encounter unknown faults, we, faults that we, we don't already know about. So a traditional classification model would fail to identify those unknown faults. But if we use similarity-based model, they'll be able to detect them because a fault is not going to be similar to a normal behavior of machine. So it'll, it'll give a dissimilarity score of one and we'll know if it's not normal, it's something different, it's, it's fault. So what we have discussed so far, we talked about what machine learning is, where we use machine learning in daily life, and we have why machine learning is gaining popularity is because we have increased the amount of data we generate and also the computational power, different types of machine learning. And I showed a couple of examples of where we use machine learning at JLab, but there are plenty of other applications that we use machine learning at Jefferson Lab and I've listed some of them here, uh, but there are more. Thank you. Thank you, Kishan. Hi, everyone. My name is Candace, and I'm also a member of the Jefferson Lab team. I will be helping with the Q&A portion of this session. We have several questions that were pre-submitted. If anyone has a question, feel free to type it now in the chat. We will try to get through as many as possible in the remaining time. So for our first question, Kishan, are machine learning and artificial intelligence the same thing, or are they different, and how? Thank you, Candice. Um, this is a great question. I'm glad you asked this. Um, machine learning and artificial intelligence are interconnected. And in fact, a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but they are not the same. Artificial intelligence or AI is the ability of a machine to mimic human intelligence, whereas machine learning, on the other hand, is the machinery or tools that we use to build AI. So in very simple words, AI is an umbrella term and machine learning is a subset of it. All right, thank you, Kishan. For our next question, what type of learning and machine learning do you use most at Jefferson Lab? Great question. Um, most widely used type of machine learning in general is supervised learning. Uh, when we have the target label information, of course, because it needs that. Um, it is relatively simple to implement and it generally produces better results than unsupervised learning for the same task. Now at Jefferson Lab, we use all the three types that I mentioned earlier, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. But if you ask me which type is used most at Jefferson Lab, it is again supervised learning. Um, now within supervised learning, there are a number of subtypes, um, different model architectures, different model types and so on. So we need to find the one that is most suitable for a given task. Now, as we have a lot of different applications with a lot of variability, 
um, our machine learning models are also very different from one another. All right. So for our next question from our chat, what kind of degree do you need to work in machine learning? Um, I think someone could work on machine learning with just a bachelor's degree in computer science or data science. Um, if you want to do research, um, I think it's good to do a master's degree and PhD in, in machine learning or data science. I think there are a lot of different universities offering um, PhD specifically in data science or specifically in machine learning. Um, so for research, it's always good to have advanced degrees. But if you want to work on um, applications, for example, taking already developed algorithms and applying them to different interesting problems, I think um, bachelor's degree would be would be enough too. Okay, so how detrimental can a mistake from the data feeder into the model be? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would I would divide the answer in two parts. Um, you can have a mistake in data, which is in the training data. Uh, so if your training data is is not good or it has some mistakes, uh, the trained model will not be that good. Um, and the other part is, let's say you have good training data, you train the model, but you feed wrong data during inference when you are doing the prediction. So then your, your predictions will most likely be not accurate. There are advanced techniques to, to detect those kind of scenarios, something called uncertainty quantification. Um, and that defines the confidence of the model. So if the model is very confident, that means um, the data it has received is good and it's, it's in well distribution of the training data. Uh, it'll be very confident and low uncertainty. But if there is a mistake in the data, it is most likely uh, the prediction, the model will not be very confident and you'll get high uncertainty. So there are ways to detect those things, but um, the, the, the mistake in the data can really harm the predictions. All right, so speaking of um, confidence and computing intensive requirements, you mentioned that computing intensive requirements for machine learning, um, does, do those requirements mean that you need to use supercomputers? Um, very good question. The short answer is it depends on the task at hand and the data being used. Um, for context, let's understand what is the main difference between a laptop computer and a supercomputer. A laptop or a desktop will most likely have a single CPU, central processing unit, and a single GPU, maybe a graphics processing unit. These two are responsible for computing. It will also have a small amount of memory in the order of megabytes or gigabytes in some cases. Um, now, a supercomputer, on the other hand, will have hundreds of CPUs and GPUs working in parallel. Um, it will also have a lot more memory, allowing us to store large data sets and process them in short time. So to answer your question, if we are training a machine learning model to do a very simple task, such as identifying handwritten widgets, uh, the model will be small and will need small amount of data. So you can certainly train it on a laptop computer. But if you want to train a model to do more complex tasks, such as playing the game of chess or Go, um, the model needs to be relatively large and it will also need a lot of data. So you need a powerful machine with large memory to train that model. Something like a supercomputer will be very handy in that case. All right. So how do you see the computation industry developing in the coming years to address machine learning? Um, yeah, I think um, we are we are actually so as I mentioned, there are GPUs which are more advanced um, computing units um, than central like CPU central processing units, and the GPU industry in particular, um, it started with graphics processing like the gaming industry started the GPUs, uh, but now we are actually modifying and tweaking those GPUs to be more um, like to be more faster on the uh, computation of the neural information, for example, the neural network training. So for, for machine learning in particular, 
I think we are we are we now starting to develop advanced hardware specific for that task. Um, so I think we'll see uh, a lot of supercomputers coming up in future, which will have uh, a lot more po computational power. Okay, so another question from the chat. How many layers and neurons does a network typically have considering the accuracy required? Um, it, it depends on the, the complexity of the task. Um, I mean, if, you, if the task you are training the model for is simple, you would need a really small network, like a few layers, uh, maybe five or up to 10. Uh, but if you are if you are training it for a more complex task, you might need up to 20, 50, or maybe 100 of layers, or more, maybe more than 100. So it really depends on the task that we are training the model for. All right, and I think we have time for one last question. What does Jefferson Lab have to manage the huge amounts of data it generates? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Jefferson Lab produces uh, a lot of data uh, in the order of terabytes per day. And um, these data are generated by four experimental halls that we have uh, to produce experimental data. And we also collect data from accelerator operation for, for evaluation and improvements. Um, we also generate a lot of simulation data for different purposes. Um, so it's a lot of data altogether. And after collecting these data, uh, there needs to be some processing to clean and organize this huge amount of data before it goes to the physicists for the analysis. So we have our um, in-house cluster of CPUs and GPUs with very large memory. It is in fact a supercomputer. So we use this supercomputer to collect, process, and store the data. Um, it also comes handy in the analysis of these huge data sets and of course, also for training machine learning models to develop AI. Very good. So thank you so much, Kishan. That's all that we have time for today. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Back to you, Kishan. Thank you, Candice. Um, thank you all for joining today. Uh, this concludes the second season of the Bite Size Science with Jefferson Lab. Please make sure to check our YouTube page and watch other episodes if you missed. Um, see you in the next season.